Um, this is recorded for on YouTube. It won't be up until like next week probably, but in case you guys ever miss the event uh, throughout the year, we do, or I do. Hopefully the other teachers will start doing that too. They'll start recording and putting it up on uh, YouTube and sharing with you guys so you guys can watch it from home. Um, so essentially guys, I did put some papers back here. Uh, it looks like most of you guys got it with my business card as well. With my contact information, being seniors, parents of seniors, uh, you guys are, I was, I was scolded for saying senior parents should come. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, and I responded, oh, the youthful parents should come with their senior students. Um, so, yes, you guys are very vivacious. And, um, but you guys should all have my contact information. You've been through at least, this is my third year, so, um, and, and some of you guys, a little bit less than that. But uh, feel free to email me. That's probably the best way to get a hold of me. I get on my phone, all the devices, that kind of thing, and I can do it in between all my meetings, um, whereas the phone or software. Oh, I'm gonna find a dead zone again. Um, it's not always accessible. Uh, so, and I really apologize, this is very small. Our projector just needs to be tossed and get a new one, uh, but we'll do my best. It's also, I'll, sh I'll share with you a link that you guys can go on, and there's a PDF of this thing available, along with a ton of other resources that you guys can download and read through. Uh, so essentially, we're gonna go through kind of where are we at, where are we going, and when do we need to look at some stuff tonight. Um, I'll share some data about, a lot of this will focus about four-year colleges. Um, most of the people I see here are probably going to be focusing on four-year colleges, uh, but for the sake of people watching this later, I, I will be going over a little bit of stuff about community college and uh, some other important aspects. Um, but I'm more than happy, one of the benefits of coming to these things is being able to ask questions. So any questions you guys might have? that maybe the whole audience would like to see uh, answer, go ahead and ask. Otherwise, questions that are maybe a little more personal or applicable, maybe, maybe only your student, let's set aside some time maybe right after this or you know, an email. We can, we can get those answered pretty quickly. Uh, we'll go through these UC, CSU uh, requirements, admissions timelines, tips and pointers, uh, some private school information with the Common App. Uh, those are very specific, so we'll spend a little bit of overview time uh, there might be some, those are probably the specific questions that we'll get. And then, kind of what the process and procedure is for getting things done here. Okay. This is that link that I told you guys about. If you guys have a smartphone, you can scan it. Um, otherwise, if you can see that link, it's a shortened link. Just copy it down and enter it to your browser. You can even put it on your phone or if you have a tablet with you, you can pull it up now. Uh, feel free to write that down. That will link to um, a shared Dropbox. Anybody use Dropbox? Shared Dropbox folder uh, that's specific for seniors. I have one for every grade level. I'll be giving them out. I've started to populate them. As the year goes by, I'll be adding more and more information to those. And they're broken down with little subfolders like academics, college, UC, CSU, financial aid, all that stuff. So feel free to peruse that at your leisure. Everybody got that? If not, this link is also accessible on the website. Uh, under the counseling area, it'll say, I forget what I titled it. Uh, it'll, it'll come to me. All right, so some parent norms. Man, that's small. Um, I can barely read it. So there are some important parent and student norms that I want to go over. There's, not, there's no students here, so I will gloss over those. Um, but the important, important stuff for you guys to know is there is some important boundaries that you guys need to have, okay? Um, First of all, it's time for you to let go, okay? And some of you might be happy about that. Some of you might not be very happy about having to let go because you have your own idea of what happens in college and where you should go to school, how things should be done. You've had your time. You went through the process yourself. Things have changed since you've gone through that process. And, and you know, it's time for the student to step up and this is when they really become that adult, okay? And if you do everything for them, that's the only thing they're gonna be used to. When they get to college, that won't happen, I can promise you that. And so really stepping back and saying, you know what, I'm here to support you, and I'm here to be your cheerleader, but you're the doer. You're the person getting through this, you're the person making the choices with some guidance on our part, because you guys do have an important piece, um, and I'll mention some of those pieces as we go along. Second is like separating the nuts and bolts. So essentially, the process piece, 
you should be involved in. How much money can we afford? When, helping them maybe keep track of some deadlines in a loose fashion. Okay, well, you know, November 30th is coming up over Thanksgiving break. Probably should work on your applications. Whereas doing the, pro like, let's go, let me help you fill this out every step of the way. Those are two different things, and one of them is okay, one of them is not. Again, separate, but do, or support, but do not do. And then plan time to talk. If you haven't yet, I mean, you guys are gonna be supporting your child or children in college for the next four, five, maybe six years, um, depending, if they, depending what school they go to, and then also depending if they go to grad school and that kind of thing. So your investment is very deep. Uh, and so really talking about and having an honest conversation about one, what the expectations are in college, and then two, how much you are able to contribute. And, and you know, you have to be realistic with your finances too. Don't just say, I'm gonna write a blank check and you can go wherever you want. Realistically look at what you can actually afford and what actually is a good investment for your student. I can help with some of that piece. I will tell you off the bat, the financial side of it is a little bit less of my forte than the admissions piece. Many times that's super, super specific to your own financial personality and your own situation. Um, the general pieces, like your, your income, filling out the FAFSA, helping make a good decision in terms of your award letter, I can do that. In terms of like deciding, is this affordable for me? Many people have you know, businesses, there's a lot, a lot of really specific things that will play into it. That is the one area that I will tell you that if you have a very complicated financial situation, maybe you've had a divorce, you're separated, or annuities and a lot of investments, it pays off most of the time to get a financial advisor. I can rec recommend one. Cool, that's my question. Um, Jim Davison Jim, well. is his name. He's local here in Todd City. He's a great guy, he's very helpful, and he knows his money. Um, he will help, many times he, he is expensive. Um, I want to say it's like $1,500, and that's like, <gasps> but most of the time, he will save you 10 times that in your, in your finances you're paying towards college. Okay, and I, I don't have his number off the top of my head. If you, come, if you shoot me an email or something like that, I can shoot you his number um, and his email address. Is that the gentleman who gave the talk last spring? Yeah, he's a, he's, a, he's a balding gentleman, you know, probably mid 50s, 60s-ish, I'm not a good age. I can judge the high school age ones, but not the older ones. So the student rules, just quickly, I know we have a ton of stuff, and I promise I'm gonna to try to get you out of here by 6.15-ish. Uh, make sure that the student is looking at the college in terms of what they wanna do after the college, after they graduate, okay? They don't wanna to go to school, they're not gonna be a forever student, they have to look beyond their college career. Uh, and don't just have them look at those four Chevy Toyota schools. Do you know what I mean when I say that? Those Harvards, those Berkeleys, the Cal Polys, the big name schools that are these fancy names that everyone throws out like, oh, my son or daughter got in there. There really isn't, in the, this day and age, there's very few bad colleges. There are a few excellent colleges, but there are very few bad ones. Most other ones are great in between. There's a college out there, there are probably 10 colleges out there that are hugely better fits for your individual son or daughter, then maybe some of the ones their, you know, their peers are going to, just because the name. Okay, so I really want you to focus on a good fit. That is what I, in most colleges, college advising people will tell you: find the best fit, academically, socially, financially, location-wise. There's a ton of different metrics you can look at, but really looking at that piece is important. Helping them stay organized. The deadlines that if the, if you leave here and go home and tell your students any one thing, tell them deadlines matter, okay? I tell them this every year. Every year they don't meet deadlines. These deadlines stick and these deadlines will hurt if you do not keep them, okay? For example, the CSU and the UC applications, they are due November 30th, which is Saturday, I believe this year, over Thanksgiving break. So, you know, kind of like insult to injury, it's not only on a Saturday, but it's also on Thanksgiving break when you're gonna have tons of family in town, things doing, you're traveling. I'm not, no one's here to kind of get, answer quick questions, so please make sure they make that deadline and things go down. 
The, all these applications don't wait till 11.50 at night, 10 minutes before it's due to click the submit button. The servers crash. 100,000 other students are doing the exact same thing at the same time, so don't wait. And then again, I'm gonna cover this a little bit more. Apply broadly, okay? But you need to make sure that you're doing a reasonable amount of number of applications. Don't apply to 50 schools. One, it becomes expensive. Two, it wastes a lot of time. That's what your research is for ahead of time. You want to really narrow down to about six to 10 good choice schools. Seven is kind of the magic number, okay? All right, so where do I apply? So there's gonna be three words, reach, uh, target, and safe, okay? Those three words are gonna be the categories that you're gonna be using when you're looking at your colleges. Reach is based on your individual student and their performance, what they're involved in, their SAT scores, their GPA, their grades, all that stuff. Their reach schools are gonna be schools that they might not necessarily fit with the majority, the median applicant pool, okay? These are the reach schools where it's gonna be, there they fit, they're, they're close, they're not like a 2.0 if applying to Harvard, but they're, they're close. They might be a, a 3.7 or 3.8 and, and really want to go there. It's a good fit. They really want to go there. It's, their, it's kind of their wish list school. Okay, that's going to be your reach school. The, safe, or the uh, target school is going to be you fit pretty well right within where those kids, what those, that school is admitting. Okay, your, your SAT scores are with, within a reasonable range. Uh, your GPA is kind of within a reasonable range, and your, your chances of, of, be, of getting admitted are good, not perfect, but they're good. You're going to want probably about two to four uh, of those schools that you're going to be wanting to look at. Depending on how targeted your son or daughter is, it might be closer to two. If you have no idea, I always recommend four, okay? And then finally, safe. Uh, safe, again, probably another two to three. These are schools where you are a pretty sure bet in. Okay, you're gonna make sure that you're gonna be on that list, and if you, you're gonna be kind of above what their target audience and population might be. However, you still want it to be a great fit school, where you will be happy there, you're, you're gonna be happy with academics, they have the major that you want. None of these schools should be schools that you're settling for. You, when you apply, any admissions, if that's the only admissions that you get back as yes, you should be totally stoked to go there. You can be a little disappointed you didn't get into your reach school or your safety or your target school, but that safety school you should still be really happy to get into and go go there if that's the only one that comes back. Okay. The last thing I'll tell you that no admissions doesn't matter what level, what school, what university system, none of those things are truly safe. Everything under the sun and college admissions is conditional. And what I mean by that is conditional is you are admitted based on your current classes, your current kind of academic progress, uh, no discipline issues, like no big red flags that you can think of. Any of those red flags come up, your admissions is in jeopardy. They can and will cancel your admissions June 1st. So just make sure your students know that that's when that senioritis comes in and they get in themselves in big trouble when they get to spring semester, they got their admissions notice back and they're like, well, I'm cruising through Miss J's class. Nope, they might get denied. Okay, so they have to really push through. Uh, any questions so far? Nope, okay, good. All right, so our options, I kind of went over options, our four-year schools, our CSUs, our UCs, our, our privates, um, our uh, military academies, uh, those types of things are all kind of like, um, not upper tier, but like our more challenging prospects. We have community college aspect, which is our two-year uh, JCs. Uh, we have 112 in, in California. There's many more outside the state. You're gonna pay a lot more money to go outside the state, uh, but there are tons of different options that have transfer pathways to the four-year university. So say you don't get into any schools that you really want to go to, there's still another option to get to that four-year university. Uh, so many times, four-year people will say, community college, that's cheaper, I want to go there. Sometimes, sometimes it's not. It really depends. And this is kind of that money side where it really depends on what your finances are. Uh, 
if you're a low-income family, it's going to be more, you know, it could be cheaper, actually, for you to go to a four-year school. You're going to get more scholarships, you're going to get more financial aid in terms of what's going to help you offset your costs, okay? And then trade or vocational schools. Those are, you know, your YO techs, your uh, UTI, uh, that kind of school where you're learning to be a mechanic or that kind of thing. All right, University of California. I do apologize, I'm going to breeze through some of these main points because um, there's a lot to cover in these couple of major college systems. Most of them are pretty straightforward, okay? Again, the application for the UC system is actually already open. Okay, you can go online, create your account, fill it all out. You can't actually hit submit until November 1 and pay your money, but you can actually go online and fill it out starting last month. Um, the CSU application is not open until October 1st. But the UC system, they changed it this year to accommodate because they knew that people took a long time to fill those things out, okay? One, one application for all the UC campuses, okay? So you're gonna go online, you're gonna fill out one application, you're gonna tick off all the campuses you wanna apply to, you're gonna pay a $70 fee for each of those campuses you tick off, but you only have to submit one application. Um, there are fee waivers, so if you're also a lower income family, um, it will typically ask you on the application, you know, would you like to apply for a fee waiver? And you click yes, you enter your family income, it'll determine right then and there if you need to pay money or not. Okay, so if that's you, I would definitely go for it. When you're ordering test scores, many times it'll ask you to order test scores. You order, for all the UC campuses, you order one to one campus, and it'll go to all eight. So you don't need to order eight test scores, you just order one to one campus, and they share it through their unified system. Okay. for like the SAT, ACT, or SAT2s, and that kind of thing. This is real hard to see again. Um, I, this, I just got the UC stats uh, for admissions for this last admissions class. Um, and it kind of goes, it does, they didn't order it. Yeah, it's really, I'll read off a few of them to you guys. So like Berkeley, for example. Uh, Berkeley had, a, had an 18.8 .8 admissions rate. It's a relatively low, it's gonna be your most competitive UC. Uh, you know, if, actually, I take that back, UCLA was more competitive this year. Uh, with a 16.3 admissions rate, uh, your least competitive, uh, anybody can guess? Yeah, Merced. <laughs> um, I not Merced sometimes, I apologize, Merced, but they, are, they have a great campus, they're just like, not a very great location, um, which turns a lot of people off, but if you're in for UC, if you, maybe you are not quite, that might be, you know, the UC system might be a little bit of reach. UC Merced's a great option. They have a great UC quality education uh, with a brand new campus. I mean, it's like less than five years old or something. And I think great professors, great education system. Not quite, you know, Santa Cruz or San Diego, but still a great school. And most of them range in between there. So I would say most of the UCs are between 30 and 50% admissions rate. But you can see, uh, there were, like at UCLA, there were 55,000 applications just in one year. So when we say how much competition there is, and, and this is like not even that bad, when you start looking at some of the Ivy League schools and that kind of thing, it gets even worse. Um, but, you know, not to scare people, I show this as a reality check, that your kid may be 4.5 GPA, 2800 on the SAT and all the, you know, they don't have a 2800 on the SAT, but, you know, really high achieving student, they still could not get into these schools. They still deny students like that. Not because they don't want them, but because they want a broad application class. They don't want all the valedictorians necessarily. They don't want all of the highest achieving students on their campus. It'd be somewhat of a boring campus, I would think. Um, so, so when students are denied, it's not necessarily because they were a poor student, they didn't do something right in their application, they may, might just not just have met that cut of that certain type of population they're looking for, okay? And, and it's not anything against the student. Colleges have their jobs too, they gotta fill a broad, you know, diverse applicant class, and they, they use their tools to their abilities. Again, UC website has other information. 
there are no letters of recommendation needed for the UC system or the CSU system. So when you're looking at this stuff, you do not need a letter of recommendation. Those letters are mainly going to be for your private schools, uh, schools outside the state system. Many, most of the common app schools will require letters of recommendation or multiple letters. All common app, well, we'll get there, but all common application schools will require information from me and usually a letter from me, uh, along with some documentation in terms of like your grades, your uh, GPA, your class rank, that kind of thing. Uh, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, the GPA, so when your GPA, your GPA is not what it says on the transcript, your GPA is actually recalculated by the UC system because they only look at your sophomore and your junior year and only your A through G classes. Okay, some people that hurts, some people it helps. You had a bad freshman year, you know, though they still consider those grades, but when they're calculating that GPA, 10th and 11th grade only, A through G classes only, meaning those classes that are, you know, your English, your math, that kind of thing. Um, they will want to see your SATs or your ACTs. Most, 98% of colleges out there, they will accept either or, like, or both. You know, they will look at them. They have a very neat little table to compare and cross-tabulate. Oh, like 20, you know, 2,000 equals this on the ACT. So they can make a pretty general comparison between students. If, if one uses an ACT, one uses an SAT. Um, you know, they do consider other factors, like your leadership classes, what you're involved in outside of school. There are areas on these applications to fill in these things. They are very limited. So you're going to want to pick and choose what you think might be most important to you. Um, you know, don't necessarily think what looks best. Don't necessarily think what they might think looks best. They really use what's important to you as a student and as a person. Because, believe it or not, those college admissions people, they actually care what you think and what you want to know and what they have, what you have to offer their campus, apart from just your academics. Were you on leadership? Were you in the newspaper club? Were you in band all four years? Like These are all things that you can decide if it's important to your application and what you want your admissions reps to read about you, okay? And then a personal statement. This is kind of like, this is the, that's the hardest part of this application. Personal statement, uh, and we will, I have it here. I'll go back to that slide in just a second. Your personal statement, and this is for this year's, the instructions straight from the application are right here. So basically, you, know, like you can't read it. It's going to ask for a thousand words total. So it's a limited amount of words, not characters, full words. Um, and you can pick how you spread out that word count. So one, one response, you might find that you're drawn more towards um, answering and, and have more depth. The other one, maybe less. You can write more about that one. They just can't reach a, more than a cumulative amount of 1,000 words. So problem number one, just to quickly read over it so you guys have an idea. Describe the world you come from, for example, your family, community, or school, and tell us how your world has shaped your dreams and aspirations. Pretty wide open. Okay, so you have some kind of uh, leg room to work around and, and use that to your advantage. Okay. One thing that I always like to suggest to students when they're thinking about writing for college is don't necessarily write purely academically. Put some feeling in it. Put some personality in it. Maintain that, like, you know, don't put misspellings and bad grammar and that kind of stuff, but really try to, you know, ha have it be you. Don't have it be your English teacher who's correcting it for you. Have it be what you want it to say. Yeah. Um, so this is not, this is yep, it's up for you guys to read right now. It's actually on their website. It's the same every year. <laughs> Um, it's the, they keep it the same every year, so um, that makes it pretty easy. But if you go on the UC app, like literally if you go Google UC 2015 uh, personal statement prompts, boom, there it is. And you can look it up. Um, the second one, tell us about a personal quality, talent, accomplishment, contribution, or experience that is important to you. What about this quality or accomplishment makes you proud, and how does it relate to the person you are? So you see, they really want to see who the student is. This is where the student can separate themselves strictly away from their grades, from their SAT scores, you know. This is also where a student who may not have the best grades or maybe not the best SAT scores can set themselves apart from those that do, okay? I'm gonna go back to a slide right before this that I put out of order and look at this. So this is called the comprehensive review. For the UC system, 
you know, people ask me, oh, they just look at their GPA and their test scores. They're important. That's not all they look at. There are 14 things that they consider when they are looking at your son and daughter's application. And they use every campus has a committee that sits down and looks at and says which ones, and they kind of rank which ones are most important for their campus. So what might be true at UC Santa Cruz won't be true at, at uh, UCLA. It could be, but they're up, it's up to each individual little standing committee to decide how to rank and pick and choose which one's important. The one I will point out, and this is the one that I'm dealing with the most right now, is quality senior, senior year of study. Okay, this is most important because many times, just like with senioritis, seniors will say, ah, I kind of like the idea of fifth and sixth period off. I like to be able to go to 7-Eleven, go home, burrito window, all that stuff, and just chill, or go home and rest before practice, and, and not take a challenging academic load their senior year, while they did so their entire junior, sophomore and junior year. They notice this kind of thing. And, and I, Suggest this is just my suggestion from kind of looking at results and that kind of thing is that no less than five classes like academic classes your senior year Mainly because you want to see they want to look and see a student who's pursuing education and pursuing excellence in their education Rather than someone who says I got all my requirements met. I'm done and they go and take a nap They don't like to see that And again guys for those of you that came in I did that. Um, this, this is online. Um, I'll go back at the end to that link. With, there's a link to electronic documentation with a ton of folders that I just shared. Um, and a PDF of this is available so you guys can go back to it and reference it later. There's a ton more slides at the end that I'll show you really quickly, but I'm not going to go over it all. That would have just tons of more information. Yeah, you. I don't know. I have to be honest, I have no idea. ELC is called Eligibility in Local Context. Um, ELC is determined, so basically, quick overview is that the top, I don't think it's 9% now, of each school's graduating or incoming senior class gets submitted, and there was a form that got sent out. Not everyone sent it back. So those students that did, we sent off uh, essentially uh, our list of students with contact information, ELC basically then, it uh, guarantees, and I use, I'll tell you about the quotes in a minute, guarantees admissions to AUC. Okay, so it guarantees a spot at AUC. Do you want to guess which UC? Merced. Merced. Uh, so, but, like I said, if that's kind of, you're, you're kind of like at the end of your rope, you don't know what to do next, it's a good safety school. Okay, it's just like, we, have, we also have up here, and I'm, Going to keep going so we can get to the CSUs and some of the other pieces, but um, we also have uh, our local CSU is Sac State. So essentially, if you there's a few caveats, uh, but but you can think of it like this: if you meet A through G, you meet all of those requirements, and you have a 3.0 or above, you're nearly guaranteed admissions to Sac State. Okay, because we are in their local area, you are pretty much a shoe in at Sac State. So that is also another great safety school. Okay? And they're a good school. Just because they're close to home doesn't mean that they're a bad school. Okay? Um, answer your question? Kind of? I'm sorry, I didn't know that answer. I can look it up though. Alright, let me keep going. So filling out the application, I'm going to skip over some of this. There, there's just it's basic knowledge. I mean, read the instructions. Believe it or not, kids don't read the instructions on anything. Well, you probably believe it because you tell them things to do and they don't do them but they don't read them. That is the first thing that you can do wrong to get your application in the bin. You can not read the, not read the instructions. It might say, list your classes in, or, in alphabetical order, and you list them in order that you have them at school. Guess what? We're not gonna take someone that can't follow directions, and then they kick you out. Some schools, I mean, they're lenient, but some schools, like, that is like a huge red flag to them. Uh, Kathy, for example. So yeah, I had a senior meeting. We didn't go quite, we're going more in depth this evening uh, because I only had it for about 40 minutes and they're, they're kids. Um, but yeah, we went over a little bit of this stuff. I do have uh, coming up, I don't know if I have the dates in here, but I shared with all the students. 
I have workshop days in RTI, so I have CSU, I have Common App, I have UC application workshops um, in RTI time in the mornings that students can come. They can always come and ask me. I go into their Pathways classes, like I'm going in uh, this week on Thursday and Friday, and I will mention things like this to them. And... Yes, yeah, hi. Um, I'm wondering if your child just gets into UC Merced, for example, how difficult is it to transfer them into another UC once you've been in, in, in there? Uh, I, would, I don't know. That would be a question to ask UC Merced. Um, I don't really deal with that side of things, but I, I would imagine probably relatively difficult. Uh, to be honest. Transferring is not like what it used to be, I don't think. It's very challenging. They don't have spots. Everything's full. As you can see for the admissions rate, you know, they're not going to like say, well, you didn't get in the first time. Let's, you know, fill up, you know, eight people in a dorm room to make you, make you have room. That type of thing. So, I mean, it's a good question to ask. My gut response would be probably not likely. But you can, you, that's a good question. You can call up and ask. Many times if you have questions that maybe I don't know, that are a little bit, you know, different or, or from a different avenue. Those admissions people are are great. I Many say they do have busy times, just like anybody. But if you give them a call, call the admissions office, ask that exact question. They can probably give you the answer directly to someone that can. Sometimes on the website too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, common questions. Uh, these are things you might want to write down. Uh, we use an exact ranking system. This is something that I'll ask for on the on the application. And then we use your, your weighted A through G course GPA from grades uh, 10 through 11. I talked about that. And they will actually calculate that, but it will ask you to have a spot. Please enter your GPA. Do your best to calculate it. It'll have a little calculator that I'll give you. Um, they'll recalculate. You'll enter your grades and they will do it for you. Just do your best on that. Um, yeah. Some, so wait, some schools do weighted and some do unweighted. Yep. And does it say on the... Yes, typically. So, so you see, CSU use their own calculations. They use the, I mean, they pick out your classes that are all A through G, and then they rank them based on your, you know, an AP class is five points, a non-AP is four points for each A, and then they, they calculate just like a regular GPA using that system, but they throw out things like PE, uh, your vote tech requirement, uh, you know, some, some of, only the things that are listed are A through G course lists are counted towards that GPA. Uh, but yes, other schools, which when we get to the private schools, I'll kind of mention that again. Uh, oops, all right, let me go back here. So I'm gonna, very similar, okay? We're gonna go through this relatively, a little bit quicker than UCs. CSU is a very similar thing. It's actually much easier than the UC. This is probably gonna be, apart from like community college, this is gonna be your easiest application you're gonna do. It's literally filling out your personal information, Entering your classes, paying your money, and hitting submit. That's pretty much it. Okay. Um, again, it's open October through November 30th, so you can't actually log in. If you go and log in right now, it's going to say spring 2014. You have to wait until it says fall 2015. Uh, so go ahead and log in there. And then you apply online. Again, all of the 23 campuses, same application. You tick off the boxes, you check off and pay your money for each campus. And again, there's a fee waiver, and it all goes out, and it comes back. Don't apply to all 23. Pick a few um, and apply to those. And, and, you know, I do say apply broadly. These are probably going to be most students' best chances uh, in terms of, like, where they might fit in the best. In term, you know, there's a whole multitude of range of CSUs from, you know, Cal Poly, uh, things like San Diego State. Those are going to be kind of your upper reach schools. Um, some of your... Uh, lower, lower is not the right word, but a little bit easier to get into perhaps it would be like Chico, uh, Humble, Sac State, uh, maybe Fresno State. Those kind of schools are going to be a little bit uh, easier if you're maybe not quite the academic star uh, that some people might be. Uh, again, there's a link up here. I'm hoping that it's still the same. I think it is uh, at the bottom. Impaction is very important at the CSU. Okay. Impaction means that they are beyond full, okay? And so they will have, basically, uh, the CSE uses an equation to determine your eligibility, uh, called your eligibility index. And it's basically your GPA uh, times your, I think I have it up here actually? Yeah, there it is. Uh, your GPA times a, a multiplication factor of 800 plus your SAT score without writing. That equals your eligibility index. 
And they use that to essentially rank students. Because they don't ask for personal statements, they don't ask for anything else except for this information, that's how they essentially determine if you're able to get in or not. Um, campuses with impacted programs or campus-wide impactions. Impacted programs is like an engineering program within a school, but the school's not impacted. Or an impacted program is like Cal Poly, and the entire campus of Cal Poly is impacted, meaning they are so full that they really, really limit their admissions classes and are admitting less students. And they are also upping their requirements. And they may even have additional requirements uh, that they require for like, you know, they might have an essay requirement that the engineering park department wants, uh, and that kind of thing. So make sure that if you're applying to an impacted campus, which you can see here, if you're applying, it'll say this is an impacted program, most likely. Um, just make sure you're paying attention to that. And it usually doesn't affect most students uh, in the long run, but it could affect your admissions possibilities. All right, kind of covered that. No, again, no personal statement, no letters. Um, I, because there's 23, I didn't list all the, the admissions rate, but Cal Poly, Long Beach, San Diego State, they all had an admissions rate of 31%. Okay, and then the least competitive Sonoma State, Humboldt, Stanislaus, and Chico, about 70 to 80 percent admissions, right? Okay, so you can kind of see the broad range. Uh, so the ACT scores, uh, they process their uh, scores a little bit differently than most than the other schools. So for the ACT scores, uh, you'll have to log in. Uh, I haven't seen the student side of the ACT portal. I haven't taken it in ages. Um, but there's an ACT score manager, and you basically send it to the CSU Mentor um, campus. They have an individual campus with its own code that you send it to that campus, and it sends it to all 23. It doesn't matter if you're applying to it or not. They'll get they'll have access to your test scores. And then the CSU Mentor campus is this one here, 3594. So if you send an SAT or an ACT, or that would be the SAT score to that code, it's going to send them all. 23 campuses without having to send you $11 23 times. Uh, this is pretty important. Uh, your name, or your, I guess your student's name, it has to match everything. So if you use your full legal name, don't use a nickname, don't use a short version, or like my name's Jeffrey, I would not apply as Jeff. Okay? You need to apply as your full name. Many times it'll ask for your middle name, include it if you have one. Because many times they will look at an application and say, oh, you know, there's a Chandler, there's also a Chad. That's weird. See, they must be like twins and their parents are weird, named them two different, like very close things. It, they will, they're, they play dumb. They don't always like think through the process. They just said, there must be two students. And they won't make that connection. Things get lost, delays admissions, or possibly screws up admissions. Um, and then, Fill out your application using your transcript. Okay, I can print out copies. There's copies available online through your ARES account. Uh, you know, use that to complete your application. Don't try to think about, oh, I think I got an A. That that won't cut it because they will get copies, and if it's wrong, they will notice. You don't want them to notice. You want them to notice good things, but not bad things. All right, private colleges. Any questions about the CSUs? And again, I can come back later um, at the end to kind of review. Yeah? Sorry. Um, the admissions rate of the schools, does that include people who are applying to non-state? Uh, I believe that table was overall. overall. Yeah. Uh, most the colleges are under a lot of scrutiny for saying that they're admitting a lot of out-of-state people because they make a lot of money on out-of-state people. They're doing a big kind of campaign to say, no, we actually admitted more in-state people this year. So whether we believe it or not, I don't know. But they're tr they're definitely trying to, they're, they're hurting for money, so they're trying different ways to like figure that piece out. Um, but it, I think that whole number is complete with those people. It, it does exclude transfer, though. It's only freshman admissions. Um, so private colleges, this is when it's very vague. Um, there's so many out there. Admissions vary widely from like October 15th to uh, March. So I mean, very, 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 very much different. Um, the best route for information is through the school's website, okay? The individual website for each school. Please make sure you go on there and get the deadlines. 
I suggest all students have a calendar and also a binder with different sections for each school that they can write down important dates, things that they need to remember, keep any information they might get. That way they can keep things up and then when they're working through the applications, they pull out their binder, they open up to the school they're working on and go through that. Okay? They are going to have to remember a ton of stuff. They can't do it without writing things down. Okay, so make sure that that's one thing that you can help them with, is ask them to write things down. Put it in their phone. Put it in their phone and a calendar on paper. Like, things get lost. Okay, so here's the really confusing part, and I'm hoping I don't confuse myself. Early decision, early action, restrictive early action, re regular decision, and rolling admission. Whew. Okay, there, there's a lot of different things about there, and, and essentially, the big ones are talking about early decision, regular decision, and rolling, dis uh, rolling admissions. Okay, those are the big three. The other three you don't really run into all that much, and they're, they're just a little bit different, but the big three, one, the reason why for early, uh, early decision, sometimes you'll see ED, um, is because this is a binding contract that you are signing yourself and your checkbook into by saying, we're applying early decision. If you give us an admissions notice of yes, we are promising that we will actually enroll. If you do not, they will charge you money. Yeah, so it, it's like, it's, it's making a pretty big commitment. So this is something that I only recommend for students who have done all of their research, and also for those students that really have a good idea of what they want out of college and what they want out of life. Otherwise, it's not worth it. You might be stuck at a school that you don't actually like, with a program that you don't want to take, and, and you know be up a creek a little bit okay so really look at that be careful it really does help your admissions especially in some of the more competitive schools uh, you know you look at Harvard you look at MIT you look at Yale all these types of schools it'll help you you know three to five percent you know the admissions rate between early decision and regular which at those schools is huge like their admissions rates like seven or eight percent three or three or four percent is a big number um, and a huge way to help your chances of getting in. They do that because they want to see people that are like, for sure, like this is my school. They also want to say, we, we know we have this many kids who are going to be coming in and enrolling in the fall. So that's why they kind of give you a little bit of extra leeway with that system. Regular decision, that's normal, okay? No binding contracts. Essentially, you can apply to as many schools as you want. Um, back it up. Early decision, you can apply, or you can apply nowhere else early decision. One school, okay? You have to make your one choice, you apply one early decision, and that's the main difference between those other two. I'm not gonna go into detail. One of them, you can apply early action to other ones. Um, and the other one, I'm mixing up my head so I don't wanna tell you wrong. One of them means that you can, uh, forget it, I'm just gonna confuse everyone, including myself. Um, if you're looking at that, it will, most of these things have very explicit instructions underneath them about what they mean, what you can and cannot do, okay? Regular decision, typical application, uh, you can apply to as many schools as you want. Most schools will uh, require a decision by May 1st, and they will let you know usually uh, mid-spring-ish, okay, in terms of what their decisions are. Rolling admissions, the last thing, rolling admissions, so UNR uses rolling admissions. Um, Montana State uses rolling admissions. It's becoming a little bit more popular, uh, but basically what it means is you submit an application, they don't have like a deadline, they have an application window, they have a priority window usually. They have a priority deadline and then they'll have a final deadline which is like way late in the spring. Priority deadline's usually like December to January-ish. And that means you apply, they process their applications as they come in. Which also means they also tell you rather quickly if you got in or not. Many of the schools that use rolling admissions are a little bit less competitive. Uh, they won't necessarily have tons and tons and tons of people fighting for spots. Uh, and that's one reason why they can use rolling admissions. So usually it's a benefit for students. Uh, it's helpful to like get one underneath your belt and, and kind of go on and have some confidence. So consider a rolling admissions school. Uh, they all require, most of them require letter, letters of recommendation. There's a secondary school report which I talked about, which is my information that I send out. Uh, there's a mid-year report for most of these schools, meaning after our transcripts post at the semester, 
I go online and I set new transcripts so they could basically reevaluate you based on how you did the first semester and say, uh, we're going to keep you for next semester and see how you do the next semester. Or, very rare cases, but it does happen, they can say, yeah, you kind of you know, blew it. Sorry, uh, we're going to take our acceptance back. So don't let that be your kid. Do you have a question? No. Yes, so uh, I'll, I'll talk about letters now. Uh, so basically letters, there, there is a specific process here. Okay, we, we have, I mean, there's 20 something uh, teachers with 60 something seniors, not all those really need letters, but I mean, we have other jobs that we have to do too. Um, and essentially students are required, okay, this is a requirement, they must bring a senior profile or comprehensive, essentially equivalent, uh, resume, a list of student dates that they're, and schools that they're going to be needing these letters for, and be given their teacher or myself at least two weeks. So you, please don't, don't tell them that if they come the night before, it will probably get done. Will we be happy campers? Not greatly, but we'll we understand things are important and things get forgotten or pushed off, but please try to use that two-week minimum window. You can. I've had students already ask me, come ask me early. Uh, you know, it it helps us be able to write strong letters of recommendation, and nobody is required to write letters. I don't even have to write letters. Okay, uh, there are options for us not to, and many times, if if a, if I can't write a strong letter of recommendation for a student. Maybe not only not because like necessarily they're a bad kid, but maybe I don't know them. I don't know who they are. It's better for me not to write a letter than write one that says they show up to school every once in a while, like on time and they seem like a nice kid. Like that doesn't do anything. Um, so many times I will just say, I'm sorry, I can't write you a letter. Uh, and, and so they, they can either add an extra letter uh, from somebody else who might be a more positive uh, or more not supportive because I support them, but more able to speak on their behalf uh, from someone else and add it to their application if, if they're able to. Uh, or I, have, I can just basically say, there's options on most of these applications that say, you know, I have insufficient knowledge of the student to be able to write a quality letter at this time, or like that kind of thing. I don't tend to do that, it's very rare. Um, but if I can't write a good one, or if I don't know your kid very well, which is why I tell young kids, make relationship with your parent or with your teachers and staff and that kind of thing, because that's what they will write about, which is what you do with them. Yeah. Does that mean yeah. yeah? Yeah, and then to elaborate on it, the letters of recommendation from you, you said that they need a senior profile. Mm -hmm. And that's that form that's back there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do the kids already know yep. Uh, so I suggest all students complete that senior profile. It's a good reflection piece. It's a good way to work on a resume. Uh, but typically, it's going to be for any letter of recommendation. No, so UCs and CSEs you don't, but for things like scholarships you might uh, later in the year, it, this is the best time to get that done. Uh, so, so, I mean, it's a two and a half page. It's, it's basically a resume broken down. If they have a comprehensive resume, I'm happy to look at it. Um, it does need some information from that, though. Um, it just helps us be able to fill it in, and you know, I would love to say that I know everything about all your kids and what they do outside of school, but I don't, and neither of your teachers. So it just helps us be able to like add some outside of school information into a school environment that maybe gives a better, well-rounded perspective of your son or daughter. Uh -huh. uh, okay, common application again, kind of breeze through this. We only have a little, little bit of time left. Um, so commonapp.org, they had a huge fiasco last year. They promised that it's not going to happen this year. We're hoping, um, but I can't make no promises. Uh, there, are, actually, I think there's more than that now. I didn't update this slide. There's over 500 colleges that take the common application now. Uh, one thing I will mention before we kind of get to a few of the details is that some of these schools and many of the schools actually will have their own application and a common application. Um, so make sure that you're looking at the right one. Some things like honors colleges, that kind of thing, they won't actually use their common application for that, for some of those specific programs. They'll have their own separate application that you can use. 
My suggestion is if you have the option to choose between both, save yourself some time, use the Common application. It, it's very easy. Uh, I think it makes their life easier as well. Most cases they have a, their own application mainly because they have to. Um, so you can look at both and see which one might be easier, but most cases they're exactly the same, just on different stationary. Um, supplemental forms. Okay, so supplemental forms on the common application, you're going to fill out your application, you go through a whole bunch of demographic information and info about your classes, GPA and all that stuff, and then it's going to ask each, as you add colleges to your common application, many times it'll add supplemental information, meaning extra essay questions, um, that's typically what it is. There might be some like, if you're doing like an art program, they might have you upload something, um, most of the time it's like answering a couple essay questions in, in addition to the essay questions that are on the common application already for those specific schools. And each school might have different ones. So when you're going through and you're like, well, I'm done. And then you haven't added those things yet. They need to go back and make sure that they've done that to make sure that they're going to meet their deadline in time. Common App's a pretty easy system to navigate. Um, it suits, there's only a few places that they get hung up and I'm going to cover the main ones. Uh, this is one of them that they're starting to get used to. So, Navius is what students have been using the last year and a half or so. Uh, it is becoming a bigger piece in their senior year because I require all college applications be entered through there. And actually, for the common application, you, you fill out a majority of your information on there, but things like my documentation and teacher recommendations actually go through your Navians, their Navians account. They'll go online, they'll go onto their account, they will connect the two by sign, essentially signing in, I, this is what we're doing on Friday, so don't, don't freak out that they won't know what they're doing. <laughs> this is what we're going to cover on Friday with all the seniors. Um, they will go online and connect it with the email address that they will or have created their common application account with. That will link their two accounts. That lets me send documentation through the system very easily, helps them track their progress and also um, allows teachers to upload letters of recommendation uh, and any other documentation that might be required directly to their account that gets sent directly to the colleges electronically. Any questions about that? I work with kids on that. You don't really have to worry about that. Um, I help the kids with that process. If they have questions about it, they can come talk to me. We will cover it and we will go over it, I promise. Maybe bring their computer to do this on? Yes, preferably. The question was, should they bring their computer? They'll all have uh, their little Chromebooks in hopefully the next month or so, but if they have their own, they can use that. Um, it has all that. I don't like to really have them sign on to mine because I got confidential stuff going on my computer and then their password gets all. It's just better if they bring their own. Yeah. I, we haven't done that a ton. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, there is another way to add non-staff members through the common application. Um, I will go back and verify. I haven't done this since last year, so I have to go back and remember. Um, but I believe that's the, the case. We don't. We rarely have that happen, but it, 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 I believe that happened once or twice last year, and that's how you do it. I'll look into it. Yeah. Depends on how much coffee you bring them. Okay. Um, like honestly, <laughs> people that bring me cookies are my best friends. Um, and I'm happy to rewrite things for them. Not, I mean, generally, uh, most teachers, myself, will typically write a generalized letter of recommendation. I will person. I will go back, I write basically the, the meat and potatoes of it is kind of a, you know, a, you know, general letter. It's, it's specific to them, but it's not specific to a school per se. Um, but I go back every time I need to add one and I change the, the address, the who it's to, you know, Dear uh, Merchant Marine Academy Admissions Team or something like that. That's an easy change. You just resave the PDF. Some teachers won't necessarily have the time to do that. So they might be the one, they might be, at, they'll probably upload one and that's good to go. Many times for the common application though, you write one and it goes to all of them. 
Okay, so when you're writing, when we are uploading them specific to the Common App, many times it is one, and it will be to whom it's main concern because you don't want like the other school to find out. Maybe you do, like, <laughs> make that competition happen, but that's typically not very professional for the student to have them titled to someone else going to a completely separate school. So it's typically like a to whom you may concern, you know, a generalized letter that goes out to all the schools. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to show you guys this stuff right now. This is something for the students mainly. There aren't any students here. So uh, community college, again, I'm going to kind of go through this quickly. Maybe it might help you. I don't know. Most people in here, I think, are, are kind of going through the other route. Um, here's just some basic requirements uh, for those of you watching the video. Just check out the file. Um, it'll be easier to see. The biggest things I'll talk about is there's no placement. There's a placement test, but there's a no admissions test requirement. There's actually no admissions process. It's all enrollment. Uh, so you basically can get in. Uh, if, if you're 18, you have a high school diploma or like a, essentially like an equivalency uh, test from a high school. You can be you can enroll at pretty much any community college you want. Uh, the challenge is getting classes. Uh, so many of the, that's one of the big challenges that people are take, seeing and taking and why sometimes going a four year route may be cheaper. Uh, and one, that's only one reason, is that sometimes the two year option can actually take three or four years because there's so many people at these colleges that they will overfill their classes and they may only have it once per one semester and it'll be a whole other calendar year before they offer it again. And so if you don't get it that one time, you might have to spend a whole other year getting that class. Because once you graduate high school, you get your diploma, not applicable to right now for those people that are taking Sierra College classes, but once you get your high school diploma, you're no longer a high school student, you take one class, one single one credit class, or three credit class, or how many credits, you are no longer a freshman applicant. You are now a transfer applicant. You now have to have 60 transferable units to go to any CSU or any UC. Okay? So that's a very important thing for you guys to know. There are a few small things, like if you're a spring admit, some schools have like a spring admissions, they have some special exceptions that you can take a class or two to get started while you're waiting for your admissions because the fall was too full or something like that. I would just ignore that, pretend you didn't hear it, if, unless it really applies to you. Don't take any classes if you're going to be, say you don't get into any of your schools you apply to, you still want to go to a four-year school, you need to wait either until spring or most typically the following fall. And you can still apply as a freshman applicant. You essentially take a gap year. Okay? Uh, the last thing about community college that I kind of touch on is that they need to have a plan. The biggest thing that kids get screwed up on in community college is they don't have a plan to get them through their degree or into a transfer program because they go in, they want to get a job, maybe they have a kid, they have to take care of family issues, a lot of these things get in the way and they kind of go from being a full-time student to being a three-quarter student to being a half-time student to like taking one class to being, I'm done. And they never finish anything. So that's the biggest thing that can get in the way. So if they go with a plan, we see students going through, and yes, it could take three years to do a two-year transfer program. If you're on it, if you're at a school that's a little less popular or less impacted, because some of the bigger schools, you know, Cuesta, they're going to be probably on a little bit longer pathway because they're going to be trying to funnel a bunch of kids into Cal Poly. Um, there are some local schools, so many times the community college will have a local feeder school that they have a transfer agreement with that you, they say, you meet this many classes with this kind of grades, you're pretty much guaranteed admissions into this school. And it's usually their local area. So like Sierra College would probably be Sac State, and, and so on and so forth. Again, much the same process, but with usually data, later deadlines. Again, don't worry about the admissions, it's all enrollment, uh, but you do have to worry about the class availability, and then check for the transfer agreements, and that the AA, the associate's degree, is kind of where you're, what's gonna help you get to your end, uh, end goals. Um, earlier deadlines, so most of the deadlines are much later, uh, much, much later, sometimes middle of summer for enrollment. However, things like housing, financial aid, there is financial aid at the community college level. You should still fill out the FAFSA. Many of these deadlines happen much sooner and they will pass you by if you don't pay attention. 
Okay, um, things like like Sierra College they actually have dorms down in Rockland, and so students that might want to go down there uh, because Truckee doesn't have a full complement of classes. Uh, the Rockland campus has the majority of their classes. They know people have to travel from different areas, so they offer dorms. However, they are competitively housed, so you have to apply. And you have to apply early. I think the, de the, the deadline's in like February or something. Uh, the new form's not out yet, so they haven't started taking applications. But that's something to keep on your radar, is keeping that option open. All right, so it's six o'clock. I may go through a few of these slides. These are kind of the extras that I was just gonna put on here so you guys can review later. Um, let me just kind of get a, let me see what might be the best thing to go through. Um, actually, let me just show you guys. I show all the students uh, the Novitz account. I'm gonna show you guys a little bit about, basically, maybe you guys don't know. Many times seniors, what are you gonna do? I have no idea. Well, <laughs> all right, now we, now we gotta get going, let's go. It's the fall of your senior year. Okay, if you have no idea, there's a couple different free tools that you guys can use to help narrow things down. Um, many times I'll have students or parents come in, okay, let's talk about college. Which colleges should I go to? You'd like, well, did you think about like what kind of major you wanna have? Where do you wanna live? Where do you want it to be? Uh, how big do you want it to be? What kind of sports teams might you want it to have? What kind of majors do you want it to have? Do you want it to have a, a degree that funnels into a master's or a doctoral program or med school? These are all questions that, you know, if, you, if they haven't thought about, they need to think about that before they pick a school, not after. Those are defining questions, not questions to ponder after you say, well, I'm going to UNR. Like, that's, that's the school for me. And you might think that, but if it doesn't have what you want, it's not a good fit. Okay, so those are questions. If you're going to come, if you're going to have them come and talk to me, please make sure that they have a general idea of some of those, because I will ask them, and if they say I have no idea, I say, okay, well, you better do some heavy thinking about some of those things, because next time you come in and talk to me in a week, I'm going to ask you that same question. Unless you can give me some of those answers, I can't really be a huge help to you because there's six thousand colleges in the United States. So this, some of these tools kind of ask those questions. Uh, in a way that they can kind of fill out a little form and say, well, I want it to be less than 10,000 students. I like the small school environment. And it'll narrow down schools that way. So this program, we have, they have that within the Naviance, and I've covered that, they've used that all before. I'm gonna sh show you quickly some screenshots from another tool that's similar but different. Uh, this is from College Board, makers of like the AP tests and the SATs and that kind of thing, called Big Future. Okay, Big Future is a college search tool. They have a ton of stuff. Um, this is probably a little bit old, so they probably have a little more than 4,000 schools up there right now. Very similar with the nominates. They have about 4,500 schools to look from. Some of them, they do have community college uh, options within these search tools, so they can search for two or four year school options. Um, when they're looking at this, they can go through here on this left hand side, and, and essentially with the nominates, it looks very similar, so you can go back and forth, they can, this is where they're gonna narrow down their information. So a four-year school, most of them have a slider or tick boxes that say these are must-haves, these are like, meh, and there's like, I don't really care, okay? These are the things that are gonna narrow down. If they put all of them as must-have, they're not gonna get a very good result. If they put none of them as must-haves, they're gonna get a very broad result, okay? So really like focusing on what the key pieces are, if they don't really care about how big the school is, don't really care about it. But if they care about, like, it need, it's gotta be in California, or you care about it, it's gotta be in California because it's gonna cost us less money, probably, you know, that is gonna be a must-have that you have to consider. You can narrow things down by location, many times by their general regions, so the Pacific Northwest, Southwest, East Coast, Central uh, America, or Central US, um, or even by state, sometimes even, like, larger metropolitan areas, okay? You can narrow down where schools are, you know, spit out. The more things that you add to this, the more specific list you're gonna get back. Actual schools. So you'll get a list that looks like this. So Loyola Marymount, uh, Chapman, Claremont McKenna, and anytime you see this, both on Naviance and on this program, you can click on these links to these schools for tons of more information. There is a boatload of information in here from 
how much, what their admissions rates are. You guys were like, saucer eyed about those UC admissions. Let's look at some of these other schools. Um, and that helps us be able to pick out, is this a reach school, is this a target school, or is this a safety school? So when you're looking at these, don't look, I mean, it's kind of like buying wine. You go by and you just look at the label, you know, well, that's cool, or where it's from, you know, but you don't really know anything about it. You need to do the research. You need to turn that bottle over and read what it says, or else you're just picking something on the pretty graphics. Okay. Right, so it varies widely. Some schools like Cal Poly, you apply as a, you, they make you choose uh, as you apply. And then when you apply, I went to Cal Poly for two years as an aerospace engineer. You cannot, it's pretty much near impossible to change schools um, and colleges or programs within the school. Sometimes like if you want to change from like aerospace engineering to mechanical engineering, that's doable. But if you're going to go from like aerospace engineering to school counseling, not very doable. So many times students will have to leave and find another school to go to. Um, so doesn't really answer your question, but I don't know if there's a specific answer to your question. It's going to depend on each school, um, and I don't I, I don't have any like data or proof to back up one way or the other. So I don't I don't know. That's my answer, I guess. So sorry. <laughs> any other questions? All right. Right, so there's no good neighbor policy anymore. No. Uh, there's not. Um, do you know, do they do Wooey still? They do Wooey. I do. It's 100% of in-state plus 50%. Right, so it's going to be like halfway in between like the out-of-state. And that's the most cases. Is it's going to be, it's going to be above your in-state, but it's going to be less than your out-of-state at some percentage at any Wooey school, essentially. Uh, so. Yeah, the, it's going to be essentially your, your in-state tuition plus 50% more. Um, so, I mean, you could go there and, and hope for scholarships and that kind of thing, but you're, it's going to be more expensive than being in-state resident. And most WUI, uh schools, they are somewhat competitive, if not competitive. So, like, uh, if you're going to be applying as a WUI applicant, uh, putting your name in sooner as a WUI applicant will help you uh, be have more chances of being a recipient of the movie. Um, some schools, you know, Montana State typically has like, they just throw them out there, you know, like that. Other schools guard them more closely and like are more careful with, you know, they have a limited amount and more people than they have to give out to apply. So Jeff, do you mean, if you're going to apply early, apply November 1st? Is that what you're talking about? Like the application and stuff? The when movies are awarded, you know, I have to be honest and tell you that I'm not a movie expert. I moved from the Central Coast where nobody wanted to leave California. <laughs> Everyone wanted to stay here or to go to a private school somewhere else. Not many people wanted to, you know, we weren't this close to a school like UNR where it's more popular for kids to go. We've only done a few of them, uh, and so, and no one's ever come to ask me about them. So that tells me it's relatively intuitive. Um, so I, I, I don't have, I apologize, I don't have a great answer. I will look, I'm making mental notes to go look into it though. Um, if you check back in with me in like a week or two, I probably have some more better information. Good questions. So this is just a quick wrapping up and I'll open it up to more questions or we can leave. Uh, when you're looking at this, uh, this is going to be what it looks like when you click on a school. You get information about how much the tuition is. Uh, they also include things like graduation rate, which is six years. I don't know why they do six years. Most of the time it says four. Um, yeah. I don't know. Um, hope it doesn't take more than six years. That's like masters and a half. Um, you know, how big it is, that kind of thing, deadlines. And then it breaks down things like uh, financial aid, 
possibility of getting awards, how many students receive award, what's the average award amount look like. So you kind of look at, okay, the cost of attendance is this, an average student might get this, we can kind of weigh it out and see if it's going to be a good fit. Uh, just quickly, I'm going to show you, uh, this is what it might look like on their Navient's account. And it also pulls data from our students. That's one of the big benefits of our system versus that one is all of this stuff, will, as their years go by using this, it collects anonymous data from our students. Their admissions, their like GPA and SAT scores and ACT scores all get kind of compiled and essentially graphed. And, and you know, if you're looking up here, I can't really read it. Let's just make something up. This is Monterey, CSU Monterey Bay. It'll say our students, uh, you know, their general admissions is 3.9. That's kind of their average GPA. It'll say our admissions GPA, so 3.85. And it'll give you kind of based on like an overall and then also our local students. So you can kind of see compared to other students that have gone through in previous years, where you might fall. And it also does things like scattergrams where it'll say their SAT score compared to their GPA. Did they get in? Did they get waitlisted? Did they get denied? It'll plot you among those plots, and you can kind of see, well, I'm kind of in the, in the middle of waitlisted and accepted. This might be a target slash reach school for me, okay? And there's a lot of information about financial aid, majors that they offer, sports, contact information for schools, so direct lines to their admissions office, their websites, that kind of thing, their applications, okay? So it's a huge resource. And I, do go, I will be working more with the students on this as this year goes by, but do you have a question? You can. Uh, we are actually in the process in the next week or two of before this time period of this year. Um, basically, all this update information has been updated by me. Um, usually, once or twice a year, doing like manual pulls from our data system. So it's not always the most current, up to date. Um, in the next week or two, we are we have been working all summer with the county because our actual information system is hosted at the county, so there's a lot of like informational stop gaps. We've had to put a lot of work into it. They're going to start doing what's called automatic updates, where basically nightly it's going to start pulling information. Once that happens, if your email is in the system, I'll be able to set up parents' accounts. That's the biggest barrier for parents not having accounts right now. Is many times we can't. There's not enough information in the in the, our ARI system to pull to populate this data for parent accounts. I can set one up for you manually if you want one. Basically, it gives you access to the same tools and, and also uh, basically observation privileges to your student and what their applications look, you know, their schools that they're applying to look like, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so that it, it could be something helpful to you. It's mostly helpful for students or possibly parents of, maybe juniors or sophomores. It's, it's helpful if you're going to be like kind of on top of them looking at their applications and they're actually on top of keeping their applications updated. Uh, but if not, it's kind of... This, this piece is. The one before that was College Board of Big Future, which I don't have any control over this idea. So this is, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, just quickly wrapping up, what I have to say is that Please make sure your students get some of this information. Remember, they are the ones doing the application, not you. Um, help them be responsible students, but don't make them be responsible students. Sometimes, sometimes little failures, little setbacks are okay, believe it or not. Don't let the big setback, you know, missing the deadlines, that kind of thing. If they're getting that close, give them a little kick in the butt, figuratively, and, you know, get them going. But if, if, if they slack off, and, and you know it's okay for them to have a learning experience because right now it's not going to like really hurt them super big. Once they get into college, it's going to cost you money. It's going to possibly cost them their seat at the college. There's a lot of larger consequences. Okay? Does anybody have any questions? And if I don't answer your question tonight, you think of it when you go home, like I do sometimes, but man, I should ask that. Please email me a question. Uh, it might take me a little bit to get back to people, uh, but. I'm usually pretty quick at the email, and, and I can get answers for you that way. Applying for financial aid, does that happen at the same time as applying for colleges? No. There's only one uh, thing that I... So financial aid, we'll have another parent night. That's a whole another ball game. It's like NBA football. 
doesn't it crosses over as a sport, but it's not really the same thing. Um, so essentially, you're gonna want it to. That'll be like probably December. We'll have that meeting. Um, January one is the big deadline, big date, not deadline to begin your FAFSA. Okay, the FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid. That's where you're gonna get all of most schools. I would say many, many schools. If you're gonna be uh, get all of their financial aid information, it's, it's gonna basically be, look like a lot like your taxes. Uh, you fill out a lot of information, uh, complete it, and it gets sent into all the schools you're applying to. They use that to process your financial aid. They build a financial aid package, send that back to you. Many times it's composed of grants, loans, uh, parent loans, uh, work study, and then how much you're actually gonna have to pay out of pocket. Each, and it's done every single year. Uh, January 1, that opens. There is somewhat of a benefit. It's it's best to fill that out as soon as you can uh, and submit it as soon as you can. You can always go back and do uh, corrections. And many times if you are like anybody else and haven't filed your taxes, uh, many times you'll submit based on your previous year's submissions. So you'll submit and you'll have the one that you actually have the return from. You use the, that number. And essentially, it's an estimate of what this year is going to look like. So if like you made tons more money or tons less money than you did the last filing, do your best to estimate. Just know that you will have to go back and redo it once your once your taxes have been filed. The only other thing, so the thing that might happen before that, and this is really dependent on your school, and it's mostly private schools. Some private schools require something called the CSS profile. Okay, CSS profile, we don't, I, don't, I have to be honest, I don't have a ton of experience with. Uh, it's, it's mostly kind of Ivy League schools, and it's a you know, dime a dozen when, those, you know, when students kind of get to the application place where they're ready to go do that piece. Um, but essentially, that is a tool through the College Board that it is a much more comprehensive FAFSA. They'll ask a lot more comprehensive questions about your finances, about your living situations. Um, and it actually costs money, it's not free. So that's the difference between the FAFSA and the CSS profile. And, and many times these private schools then will use that to award things like institutional aids and grants and stuff like that. So most of these private schools with large endowments and you know have more money to throw around, so they want a better picture of who actually needs it. That's your, your question? Where do you find that CSS profile? There will be a link on the school's website. Uh, I don't have the, the URL, it's through the College Board, so if you Google CSS Profile, yeah. Um, one thing that, just a side note, because the internet is sometimes screwy, um, when you're looking at things, always make sure that you double check the URL, okay? Things like the FAFSA, things like the CSS Profile, you're giving away very important personal information uh, that people can do a lot of bad things with. Um, so when you're going online, do not go to FAFSA.com. That is not a real website. It is a real website that looks like the FAFSA, but it is fake. Okay, so be very careful. Um, I'll get it's FAFSA.ed.gov is the website for the FAFSA. I don't know the CSS profile one. Um, many times, some things that you can look at are you know does it have a lock next to the the URL? It'll tell you if it's a secure. Uh, website. Sometimes those fake ones are not. So that's a pretty big tell. All the legit ones will have, like it's going to be an encrypted link. The fake ones may not. Okay. Um, links from your school's website will most likely always be correct. So if, if it's going to, and, and those schools, when you go through the application process, as soon as you hit submit, you know, within a couple days, they're going to get a, thank you for applying. Here's your next steps. The last thing that I told your students is, um, Check your email, okay? And use an email that you check regularly and don't use like SexyStar227 um, to apply to college. Not appropriate, they do see it, okay? Use, you know, first name, last name, three, or something like that. Just create a new email even for college applications that you'll actually check. Because they do, they will send things. You'll submit and say, hey, you forgot to fill in this one section, we need more information from you or we can't process your application. Yeah, yeah, um, and so essentially when they're checking their e because the big thing about checking the email is that they 
might get questions or things shot back at them from the college that they have to complete in order to actually have submitted your application. You might have left something out that they need. You might not have submitted your SAT scores. And unless you're checking your email regularly, I mean, they don't necessarily have to check every day if they don't want to, but at least once or twice a week. They might spit back and say, oh, you have three days to submit your SAT scores or you're gonna go to the back of the list or something like that. Okay, so make sure that they're staying on top of that. Um, they also spit out things like your checklists, deadlines, um, things you need to be doing. They'll usually get access to a college portal where they can log in and go in and see all these things, maybe submit, um, do an online orientation, that kind of thing. Okay, so good question. Any other questions as a long-winded answer? Good, you guys know everything. All right, so seriously, you guys, if you guys have questions, email me, uh, set up an appointment, we can sit down and talk. I generally tell students, give me another week or so to kind of sit down and do, you know, like the half hour, 45 minute, hour long meetings about college, just because I'm swamped with all this new back to school stuff right now, and that stuff has to get done before I can actually move on to the next stuff. Um, so, so really, like, probably towards the end of this, you know, maybe next week, starting next week, I'll be totally ready to sit down, and that, that's my favorite part of my job is working with kids on college. It's the most fun part, it's the part that I like to see at the end of the, the picture. You know, I do a lot of not fun stuff in my job too, and so it kind of makes my day more fun when I get to have college meetings. So no other questions? All right, we're out of here before, I, a little bit later than what I said, but before what I said before. Good night, guys. Freshmen, tell them to come tomorrow night.